Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, well, it's really lovely to be here, and um, especially in this building. I've had this conversation with a few people, <clears throat> but uh, we spent, my family spent a lot of time here as children. Um, my parents were both um, really big fans of art, and uh, we had a lot of art in our house, so grew up grew up really looking at things and, be, and, and sort of taking in from a very early age visual opinions, I guess, in a way. And um, this building would have been a very important part of that. So uh, a lot of the, the things I saw here are still deeply embedded in, in um, who I was growing up, who I decided to become when I was that young girl thinking about those dreams. And so what I wanted to do uh, today is uh, when Jessica asked me if I'd come to speak, I was really so delighted to be coming home, first of all, but also to be um, connected in some way to a historical um, context of, of an artist working with light because um, that is something that drives my work and has almost sort of morphed with time and place and opportunity um, into a language for, for me. And so it was really lovely to look at the pairing of um, a contemporary understanding of light with the, in the historical context then of Soroya and um, then to find out that he had a very strong connection with New York. Um, one of his most magnificent pieces is in New York, uh, 12, I think, it's, I think it's 12 paintings maybe, in the um, Hispanic uh, society. And um, I'm just going to, uh, we will just, just have a look at this, this thought for a moment. Um, I'm very interested in the idea that artists have um, sort of internalized this language of light and then expressed it and used it and worked with it um, in painting, sculpture, printmaking and various stagings and really using light as part of um, a description of an emotion or an engagement with an emotion. And I feel that um, in the context of technology, uh, light has become another kind of source, and so it's a much more external source. So the, the pairing of the internal dialogue and then the external application is really what interests me. <clears throat> so this is the piece of work that's in New York. You've probably seen some of the work, for those of you who've seen the show here, some of the drawings for these murals are here. and um, and. Even though you may come to the painting and say, gosh, I love that painting and I love it, it feels like the sun and it feels like Spain and I love the fluidity and I want to be there. So much of that has to do with the light in the work and how he's depicted that. So um, I really love that. So I'd like to, um, with, with, with Soroya being in the museum, I, I really want to go back to what happened to me as a, as a young uh, child in this museum and uh, talk about my influences in Ireland. And then as I transitioned out of Ireland into living in New York at a very exciting time in the mid 80s, um, what, that, what that experience allowed me then to start thinking about. And then as I started to collaborate with people, how I really learned a new language that I have been able to bring back into my work. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that that's the place I can live happily for the rest of time in this uh, world of exploration between um, mark making and technology. So um, I'm sure many of you know this painting, but as a child, uh, this was my favorite painting in this museum and I, uh, it's been with me forever. It's completely in my DNA and uh, Interestingly enough, when I, I spoke about this to um, last year uh, to Luke Clancy, we spoke about this painting, so we decided to come down and look at it because I'd been telling him how, you know, 
enormous the painting was and how it sort of took over my whole sort of being. And when we got into the gallery, the painting was not so enormous, but my memory of it was enormous. And um, so what I love about this, uh, I, I, I know El Greco had a big studio of painters and he did very many ver versions of this painting. So I'm assuming that there's probably a couple of different hands on this in some way or another. And, and I quite loved that a painting from that time also had this sort of abstract expressionism going on in, this, in, the, in the cliffs and the rocks above. And, and then in th this sort of connection with whatever it was he was envisioning or this sort of almost like cloud cloak formation that was sort of part cloud and part rock. And then, you know, he had this sort of this incredible glint in his eye all really to do with the colour white in many ways and this light or the source of something. So I think from very early on this idea of catching the light was, it was, was somewhere in there. Um, so I also wanted to talk about Camille's paintings. Um, and uh, we're really honoured that her daughter is here today, Michelle. So I'm delighted to be able to speak about this work um, with Michelle here as well. And she can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but um, when we were children, we, uh, we went to dance classes. And we went to a very famous uh, legendary dance teacher called Muriel, Muriel Catt, who uh, lived on, ba who taught on Bagot Street, and it was very close to my grandmother's house, and we would go there maybe once or twice a week, my sister and myself, and my brothers. Um, and anyway, this I incredible family used to arrive into the class, and they would come from somewhere, like as a child, all I knew is they came from far away. And there was this incredible woman with her children, and this was Camille bringing her children to the same class. So I always had this fascination then with this person, because they seem to be kind of fantastic and have this life that, um, you know, kind of we looked exotic and exciting to us. And so when I, as I grew and I found out that Camille was a painter, I really really got very interested in her work over time as a almost like almost like the certain Irish painters became the background tune to to what I was exploring at the time I didn't really I wasn't really aware what that was but what I really love about this painting is this play on light where you know exactly what's going on, but you're really not sure, are these planes flying or are they in a field, have they landed? The silhouette, is it a shadow of something from above? There's all these beautiful questions in this painting that have to do with light. So um, uh, anyway, that, these are the influences. And then my mother had a, um, a real passion for Cecil King's work. and. Um, it was very interesting growing up in a house then where your parents loved certain artists and, and my mother being a sort of country Irish woman who came to live in the city, I, I really loved that she just adored Cecil's work because I, as a child, I didn't really understand the language. Um, but I grew to love his work then when I learned about his... his um, how would I say it, his discoveries um, from a, a, a painter who had had a full-time career, who then at a later time in his life became a full-time artist. And that conversation was also very important to me to, to, to understand because it's also part of my life where, you know, I am, I am a collaborator as well as a solo practitioner. So really f understanding other artists' journey in that way was, was important for me. And then moving to America, I was very, very lucky. And the, the woman who's responsible for that is sitting here today, Anna O'Sullivan, director of the Butler Gallery. Because when I, was, uh, I had left college, Anna invited me to show at an exhibition she was curating in New York as a, as a, as a young curator there herself, an artist. She very kindly invited her friends to come and 
have a go of New York. <laughs> and um, I, I got to New York and just fell in love with it. And, and then a series of artists whose work I really loved, who were American, but still had some of the language of the, of the work I had grown up with. So <clears throat> Helen is one of these painters. I just absolutely, I, she's like Rothko for me. I walk into a room and I'm in front of one of her, of her paintings and I'm just completely transported and in love and um, can bring many interpretations to it. I, I really like to see her work as landscape whether it's kind of an emotional landscape or a figurative landscape, I, I really love her work. And then James Turrell. So to, to, when we were in New York, we used to frequent a place called PS1, which now is PS1 uh, MoMA out on Long Island, and, uh, or Long Island City. And they had residencies for artists, and there would be Irish artists who would be on the residencies, and we would go out there and you know, party down, because there was a lot of partying at that time. And um, uh, James Terrell had a room there. I think it might have been called the Sky Room. I'm not sure. Maybe it was anyway. And it really was one of the most magical, magical experiences. I really had no understanding of how much his work would come to me, mean to me over time, because it was organic work we were looking at. So it was, you walked into a room, there was a huge big hole cut in the, in the ceiling, and you looked out on the sky, and it was surrounded by benches, and you basically sat there and looked up at the clouds going by. So James has just all along the line, because he's really one of the great kind of visual, um, mentor people visually in my life. Uh, so I just wanted to put him in there. And then Bill Viola, another artist I came to know when I got to New York. I first worked as an intern at a, a gallery called The Kitchen, which is, was a performance art space. And we went to an opening at New Museum, which at that time was on the Bowery. And there was a piece of work in a room. And what it was, was it was up in the ceiling, and it was just a cloud projection. I didn't really know very much about projection at the time. Um, I mean, as an as a, as a art form that you could really dig into. Um, and, and there was just a cloud rolling and, and the sound of a, I think it was like breathing. Very, very beautiful, slow sound. And uh, I mean, in my memory could be, I could be sort of mixing a few things up here, but this was the impression I had. And I just thought that that was one of the most amazing things. And from that moment on, I was a huge Bill Viola fan. He's hugely influenced my work in terms of scale, scope, adventure, um, really digging into your own imagination for what it is you want to say, not being afraid to say it, having to raise the funds to be able to say it. So all of that language uh, was of interest to me. And then Christo and Jean-Claude, this just may be one of the greatest pieces of work I've ever experienced. And anyone who's ever experienced a Christo and Jean-Claude piece in situ, it's probably been one of the best experiences because his ability to create magic, um, both in a temporal way, in a permanent way, in, with light, with color, with movement, um, his uh, I've really learned a lot from Christo in particular because he has a process of working that I really like. He, he can conceptualize, he'll do the drawings, he'll work out the, the designs, you know, there's so much design that goes into his work. <clears throat> and all of that language has become very important to me as well. So finding these sort of, um, these people to anchor my own beliefs in has been very important over the years. So I want to uh, I want to move on then, because coming off of this more sculptural, installation-based work, this the the step into technology uh, has been for me it was sort of it was accidental in a way. It started with um, my collaborative work working with you two, and how that really happened was I happened to be somebody they knew living in New York when we were kids growing up. And so I was sort of this point person who maybe knew something. And we would have these great conversations about art and, 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 
and things you could do, almost like, uh, in a way, it feels like maybe a technical version of artists who worked in theatre. So artists who collaborated with directors. I sort of feel that that's what our relationship was like in a way. I was in the art world and coming out of that world. And there was a conversation to be had. So <clears throat> as Devon, if you don't know her work, I would suggest you do a good uh, search for her online. Um, she really comes out of the theatrical world. She is an artist. She does beautiful drawings. There's a gorgeous documentary on her. I think it's called The Art of Design. It's a series of documentaries. Um, um, she's done a lot of stage design for big, major rock concerts and works with architects, designs buildings, installations in cities, big public artworks. So for me, she is um, a fantastic example of a fearless woman in a world that, you know, it's definitely tough to be in because it is, it is, it, there are battles to be had that you don't have to have if you're working from your own studio and your everything begins and ends with you. So she's a very good example for me. Um, <clears throat> and when I stopped working with you two in 2010, she came on with a new team that was coming on and then did some really lovely work with them as well. So I like that there's, that I, uh, that there's these connections um, that I can now go back and reference their work and look at that work and say, okay, what's she doing? And mm, that's nice. And so I feel like there's a great dialogue there between the art and technology. Um, and then Jenny Holzer. So, Jenny would have been another artist's work who, when I first went to New York, loved. It was much more print-based because at that time, well, it was, it was print and video, but at that time it was sort of jumbotrons and everything was very large and, um, how would I say it, just uh, not as much subtlety as you can get now with the LED technology. So she just has just gone from strength to strength to strength. And I put her in there again as a, as a female artist who is working in what I would call the, the business of the technology, which means you have to we work in the, tech, in the world with technologists. So you've got to do a lot of communication, a lot of designing, a lot of planning, again, a lot of fundraising in order to deliver your finished pieces at that level. So that side of it is also really interesting to me, just that journey, because it's definitely, you know, it's, it takes a little army, and I know she has a little army. So it's just great to think that you can start by doing your single projections and, you know, your, your concepts and then work your way up and come out at that level. So that, that technology brings me into this conversation of um, the collaborative work I've done. The main collaborative work I've done has been with you two. And this screen, I just want to talk a little bit about this tour. This screen, Pop Mart, was the very first ever LED screen built to project imagery because there was a particular color. I think it was maybe the blue dioid or something that had been finally found that could make this technology happen. So when that technology was offered um, by a man called Frederick Opsmer, who's designed most of you two's uh, stage sets, the technical side, to um, actually it was uh, their manager or their road manager or tour manager at the time, Jake Kennedy, had sort of said to Frederick, Frederick, please find this thing. And Frederick went off around the world and found this thing and came back. And um, this, is the, this is the screen that started Times Square. Um, Singapore, Hong Kong, China, anywhere you go, London, where you see major big uh, display boards, this is where it started. So on this tour, my role was to um, curate the screen and also to direct some content. So on this tour, we worked with Roy Lichtenstein and the Keith Haring estate and the Andy Warhol estate. And because of, because of, sort of, because of the world that we had, a group of us had created in New York, we had access at the time to these artists to get permissions for usage of things. And, and in this case, um, 
Roy's work we felt was just perfect for animation. And we'd already, they'd already licensed some of the work for um, some artwork. And uh, we spoke to him about, would he ever consider animating a piece? And at the time, no, he'd never animated anything. So he said he would. And then we found a brilliant animator from the Royal College of Art at the time, a man called Run Rake, who went on to be very successful. Um, and Run happened his thesis. I, so I had to sort of find these different people. And I found his work, and his work, his style was not unlike Roy's in terms of it was big blocks of colour and outlines. So we paired the two of them together, and they had this amazing connection and relationship and the result was a really beautiful piece. So these were the exciting times and exciting projects. Um, and for example, on, normally you would say, oh well you know we're not going to be able to afford Roy Lichtenstein. I mean there's no way it's going to be out of the budget. And So in this case what happened was he said he would do it for, I think there was a licensing fee for the basic of like five grand. And he said he would do it, but he would just, we could give the fee to some other artist who was going to make something else. So, um, and that was just for use of the imagery. So, so that is an example, I guess, of you really just have to ask for what you think you want because you just don't know what people are feeling. And then this piece is a, an example of a piece that the concept I designed, so, it was uh, after 9-11, and it was February, uh, and it was the first major big concert public event that was happening in America. There was a feeling that something really good had to happen in, in this half-time event, which you probably have seen over the years, many big performers do the Super Bowl halftime. So we were talking about how we felt it was really the only thing we could really do was do a tribute to the people who'd lost their lives at 9-11 because it was the perfect place to have millions of people just see all those names once more. So we designed this piece and, and the concept really was that the, 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 the monument Americans love so much is the Vietnam Memorial in Washington and so we really took our cue from that and decided to do a digital version with just the names. So that is just an example of what I would say would be my use of scale. I really, really enjoy scale. And um, there was an opportunity to do something. And so this was, I'm just going to talk about this tour and give you a sample of the kind of work because this was the last tour I worked on. I stopped working with you two in 2010 to really get back to my own world. Um, and uh, this was another example of the technology in the round, really trying to do something nobody had done before. It was a lovely um, stage to be able to curate some imagery on. And then this is just a, an example of three stills from a little piece of video I'm going to show you. So my role was content director. So between curating and making content, um, for this 360 screen, the aspect ratio for the content was this very thin, low-res, wraparound uh, aspect ratio that when it was projected, of course, was huge. Um, so you really had to design what you were doing and think about what you were doing. And the tour, the concept around the tour being about space, they were connecting up to the space station every night while they were on tour. So I was thinking, well, you know, what about all that stuff we lose, like our socks and our pens and our biros and like all the, all the stuff that's, that we lose in this world. And then the shit that's up, excuse my language, the stuff that's floating around in space, the junk that, you know, is going to end up polluting the whole place. So I really wanted to do this combination of this, of this idea of space junk and take little personal possessions. And, and at the time, we were talking about uh, um, having poetry on the tour. We just wanted to include poetry on the tour. And we used to do these little incidental pieces, like these segue pieces between songs or band changing or whatever and I would get to make the segues which was always a lot of fun. So this was a segue piece and I'm going to show it to you because um, the aspect, you have to sort of go with the aspect, but we 
we, Maya Angelou had written a poem for the 50th anniversary of the UN and uh, we really wanted to use the use of this poem because we thought it was very profound for the moment we were in, although it's so much more profound now. Um, so again, finding the rights, that was sort of my job to try and find Maya Angelou, which it turns out she has a book agent at the time and that was it. And so we did a negotiation anyway and uh, she let us use the audio and we just used it for this one particular show we wanted to use it for. So I'm going to show it to you now so you'll get a much better idea of that kind of collaborative work. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet, traveling through casual space, past aloof stars, across the way of indifferent suns, to a destination where all signs tell us it is possible and imperative that we learn a brave and startling truth. We, this people, on this small and drifting planet, whose hands can strike with such abandon that in a twinkling life is sapped from the living. Yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness that the haughty neck is happy to bow and the proud back is glad to bend. Out of such chaos, of such contradiction, we learned that we are neither devils nor divines. When we come to it, we, this people, on this wayward floating body, created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible, we are the miraculous, we are the true wonder of this world. That is when, when it looks like the sun won't well, shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the clouds. <laughs> so, um, so you know that is actually one of the f my most favorite pieces that I've I've made over many years of making a lot of pieces, and um, oh, mostly because you know to be able to to speak to thirty thousand or eighty thousand people in an evening with something visual. Um, <laughs> in a platform that somebody's kindly just handed over to you is is really a joyful thing and it's very it's a very it's a it's a lot of trust is in there and so that um that relationship really i would say was that the foundation of the work that i do now so that understanding of um technology scale um, being able to go out with an idea, dream up something, and then have it realized. So I'm very grateful for that, because it's really uh, what has brought me to the work I'm making now. So, um, so coming off of uh, leaving, leaving the Roadshow <laughs> in 2010, although I had had my practice in the studio going in a parallel way, to be able to go back in with all that information was you know, a gift, and uh, but I also really needed to get all of that right out and try and find out what, what was in there after all that time. So I went into the studio and for about a year I was just drawing circles. And it was just pencil drawing for, I did many, many pencil drawings, sort of around this scale. And uh, I showed that work with Oliver Sears in New York and Brian Kennedy. And from that show, I was commissioned to make three pieces, the same, same concept, um, for the lobby of a theatre in upstate New York called the Capitol Theatre. 
and uh, it would be it was a, a, a beautiful old theatre that had been very important that was being completely renovated, and uh, it, they wanted the pieces to fit in the, these these five foot pieces. So that is what I started to work on, uh, and it was a lovely transition out of although still scale, but out of the sort of multiple of decisions down to this sort of one decision, is it going to work or is it not going to work? Um, so I also included one of my drawings because I want you to see the way I work. So I do, uh, I know the word Sharpie has a whole new meaning this last week, <laughs> but um, I usually work with the Sharpie on print paper, just like print paper out of the, out of the printing machine. And I do a lot of little sort of storyboard drawings, very fast, very quick. And then from there, they just get the concept out. And then from there, I'll do up uh, another level. I'll go up another level with a bunch of drawings. And then I'll start getting into the work. And sort of at that stage, I'll bring in the technical collaborator. I work, I work with some really great people in New York. Um, Tommy Wooten and Benjamin Price. And they make all my things happen. Um, so we'll decide, they'll decide. So for this, it was like, how do you keep the drawing very clear, but it has to be, it has to be in something that's going to be strong to hold that, but you still want the frame to be relatively uh, not lightweight, but not too intrusive on the drawing. So there are all the, those kind of decisions that go on. Um, so, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about this show that I had last year, a gallery called Costera Projects, and again, just show you my process. So on this one, I knew I wanted to make these paintings, these very small, like, sliver works. I wanted them to be on canvas. I wanted them to be very uh, traditionally painted, uh, graduating colours, colour field, really referencing the world of colour field work. And then I wanted to integrate them with technology. So had these beautiful frames made. The frames were very much part of the design. And then you can see embedded in the back is the LED technology. And then in the space, I would program the space. This particular show was a site-specific piece. That's another thing I really learned from working with you two, and that is my love of site-specific work. So when you kind of rock up to some town and you're putting something up and you're creating a whole experience and then you're taking it down, I, I really have come to love that. Um, so uh, there was a 360 audio in the room as well, and the idea would be that there would be this sunset, to, sunrise to sunset color field that you would be in in this audio. And it was a friend of mine who's a Guatemalan migrant. It was her story of coming, walking through Mexico into America. Very beautiful, very like a small story in a way, just personal notes about things she left behind and last conversations with her family. It was really beautiful. So this was the preparatory work for that. And then this was the installation piece. So there was also nine watercolor paintings. They would have been the next step up, proof of concept. And then we, I would have made a couple of smaller pieces and then taken it to the full effect. And then this is what they look like in the space. So. I think this is probably a very good example of the transition of everything I've learned. Um, to get to this point where you st the, the lighting is not interfering with the artwork, and yet the artwork is not, is not interfering with the lighting either. You're not, you're not confused, am I looking at artwork or am I looking at lighting? You're really in a space that's able to say more than one thing. So. Um, and then this was my show from last year, last summer at Oliver Sears Gallery, which was just a complete pleasure um, for various reasons. Um, and Oliver's here today, which is wonderful. Uh, this was a building not unlike a building my grandmother and my mother lived in and my aunts uh, uh, and their aunts lived in in Bagot Street in, in Ireland, in Dublin, where they grew up. and. Um, it was a it was a very important room for us as children to be in because we would go there a lot and spend time there and everything was so oldie worldy you know knitting and fireplaces and endless cups of tea um, so this room was lovely because I felt like I was getting a chance on some level to revisit a room in a in a completely different way, but still hoping to give an experience an emotional experience to 
the viewer who was coming in. So these pieces were just shards of paper, colour painted on the back, reflecting the light from the back. And then on the one on the right, that has LED technology embedded in the back. So also on a, on a uh, either on or on a timer, that can just cycle through a cycle of light in, in when there's no daylight. So the daylight and, and spotlight can affect the pieces, and then when there's nothing, they can run on their own. So this again was this, for me, this really interesting exploration on, on mark making and technology, very traditional wor way of working with a uh, very new way. So this is the piece I will leave this part of the talk on. Um, I've been uh, invited to make um, a piece of work for four digital billboards on Sunset Boulevard in 2020. And this is a sneak peek of the first two pieces of artwork. I'm not even going to tell you about the piece, but um, it's, uh, it's, it is, it is, it is a, a continuation of um, Lizeth's story from the preview show, and there's... Um, conversations that we're having and there's visuals but what's really lovely about this is that an animator who I and again this kind of ties into why it's so important to be able to stretch out and work wherever you want to work one of the animators who made a lot of lovely work for me uh, or for the for the band on the U2 tours lives in LA and we were having coffee and I was telling him I was out on a site visit to see the screen so that I could work out what maybe what they were saying to me and he said, oh, look, if you're going to do... I said, I'm going to do an animation. He said, I, I really want to animate that piece. So when you've developed the artwork, please come back to me and let's devise a way to work on it together. So that coming back to painting and being able to integrate it with the technology and sort of to be able to come that full circle is um, really a gift that has sort of come out of this journey. None of it really would have happened, probably, if I hadn't left home and gone to New York. Um, but it's also really amazing to be able to come back home and share that. So, um, I think, how are we doing on time, Jess? Yeah? What have we got left? Yeah. Okay. So, I think uh, I'm going to leave... Oh, wait a minute. No, I've just got... Well, I'll leave it on the last page because... we leave it with Helen because this, in a way is a statement from her that I feel is so important to let the work speak. And I think with, especially when you're working with, um, in my case, working with lighting, because I have all the history of where light has come from and how it's used and who uses it well and, um, what they've done with it, all the way through the artists I've just um, shown you. But to be reminded at the end of the day that you, you really still just have to let it all speak at the end of the day. So you gather all these things together and then they definitely manifest. And I think maybe, I think if there was anybody thinking what would be the key to going forward at a time when the art world is changing, um, uh, there's a lot more control that artists are now going to have over their own work, their own futures, their own legacies. Um, they're not beholden so much in the way they were in the past to, um, you know, being recognised or given permission or a lot of things. Um, that I think just always at the end of the day, not trying to guess what the market wants or is doing, or but to really sit there with the work and let it manifest. I think that's. I think that's where we're going to leave it. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we've got 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> What's this world that we're, we're, we're living in now, for young artists in the, in the audience, um, and the challenges of operating in the world today, what would your advice be going forward? You know, thinking about you know, young 20-year-olds mm. making art today, going to art school, going out in the world. It's a very different time to when we, mm. when we graduated. Do you have anything that you could say on that? So, Anna, 
our fearless leader who got me to New York <laughs> has just asking, you know, for do, do, would anybody put up their hand who's at art school or practicing art or wants to? Okay, great, great, okay. So, you know, when I was at art school, I did, uh, I wrote to artists that I was like a fangirl. And one of the artists I wrote to was a really incredible artist whose work wasn't entirely appropriate for this conversation, but a man called Leon Gallup, who's just an extraordinary, extraordinary artist, if you get to look up his work. And, and you know, I was at college and I wrote to him and I was like, oh, you know, I'm dreaming of coming to New York. And he wrote back, you know, in a letter with a stamp and uh, said, you know, when you come to New York, come and visit me, which I did. And, and uh, he gave me really one of the most fantastic pieces of advice because, you know, we came with our slide sheets, you know, with our, to maybe go into some gallery and have somebody look at them and go, oh, yeah. Um, and he said, he said, focus on your peers. So he said, don't think that people ahead of you in the art world, like shiny stars up there, the big galleries, are going to necessarily find you because they're already like a couple of generations ahead with a truckload of people who they've already made promises to. And he said, focus on your peers and make sure you grow together with those people because they will be the people who become journalists, writers, cur curators, um, gallery dealers, and you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be manning the camera, manning the sound. So make sure you build your group. And I, I think that is so, it's exactly the same right now. Except that you have a much easier chance to build your group because of your networks than maybe we had when we were starting. I mean, we, we didn't have quite the access to, um, to reach the kind of audiences that you're reaching. And I guess, I'm just trying to think, I mean, I, I, I want to be a say, I want to say don't be afraid to go out and make money to pay to make the work you want to make. Because there really is a myth, oh, well, it was there when I was growing up, certainly, that somehow or another, paying for your work or paying to the, the fabricator was a, was a step too far or not really within your, within your thing because, you know, other people seem to be able to do that. And, and I would just say, whatever you have to do to, to do that, do it. Don't really be beholden. I mean, I think for a long time, our generation felt if you didn't win the grant, you know, if you weren't on the list for some award, that somehow or another there was, a, there was a validation that was missing or that you wouldn't have the funds to do something. So I don't know if that makes any sense, and I'm not sure that's really what you're talking about, but I, I, I looked at... Um, Lee Krasner made some quote a while ago, like just, you know, don't be afraid to have a job. And I, I do think there's something about that. Um, so that's, the, they're, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm just, I'm just interested um, in the, the way, um, you know, the, the scale, you're talking about scale, and uh, I know you've also been involved in film, but the, the scale of the, the works for the, the UT tours, they, they almost seem like there must have been a production almost like a film production to get it actually up and running. And I'm, I'm just wondering, um, what was your crew like? How many people were you mm. actually working with? Did you have to almost like produce it? It, it, it sounds just like I think by osmosis, you definitely have to become a producer. But then I think artists today have to be producers. I really do. I just think the day of having somebody come along and, t you know, ma spread some fairy dust on you and you're going to be the chosen one, it's just it is not the way it works. So I think production skills, and, and thankfully art schools and, and, and places where you can learn um, film, etc., are really, have really taken that on board. So there's media courses that are connected to the arts courses and so there's so many different ways. But the, I was thinking recently how... Um, there was a small team with you two. There was the band, uh, and then there was uh, a, cu a couple of creative advisors, and then there was a lighting department, a, a design a stage department, a wardrobe department, and a visual department, and an audio department. And all of those people had people running their departments. And then everybody was just 
entitled to do whatever they wanted up to a certain point, up to a point where the whole machine just got so huge and accountability <laughs> set in on other levels. But for a long time it was really about concepts, political, social, visual, um, musical, what was happening in the zeitgeist at the time, and then different departments coming back with what they felt was maybe like, let's say, even talking about uh, in Ver on Vertigo tour, we wanted to do something with politics, so we put in the Declaration of Human Rights into the show. Everybody was saying, oh my God, that's going to be a show killer. Nobody's <laughs> going to sit there. But the way we created it was, was just so great. And then 80,000 people got to see the Declaration of Human Rights. So you could come with your things, and some things would be shot down, and some things would live, you know. But, but, but you know, one of the things you know, it helped that somebody was going to be pained for it to be made, <laughs> you know, so you could dream big, you know. Yes, my sister. Um, Catherine, just on a great talk, um, just now that, you know, as the work that you have and the people looking for people to buy it, or even people that are in this type of, of, of media, um, you know, does it change on how you on, on getting people to see the shows because maybe not everybody has the type. You know, it's not a painting. It's not people are used to maybe putting paintings. I'm just wondering, could you maybe talk about how do you find the people that actually are the, the people who are collecting this, and is that a tougher? Is is that well, for this work and for going forward, it is a lot of it has to do with com people commissioning the work. So. There, I have work opening a show in October, uh, on October the 10th in New York, and it's a commissioned piece, and it's seven LED pieces, like the pieces you saw from Costera Projects, and that commission came out of that show. So there's that conversation that comes, and then, of course, there's fabulous people who are there to make sure sales get made. And... Uh, and um, and you know, and then you, you know, then you do your various pieces of work that are going to work at different levels. So you have your prints, you have your installation work. Out of your installation work, maybe you're going to be doing some sculpture work. But that's for me. For other people, it's it's different. But um, like, let's say with somebody like Jenny Holzer, her world would be a lot of that would be to do with additions. So maybe for that one piece, I mean, Anna, you can speak more to this. Well, well, interesting though that Sarah brings that up because, like, when you when you talk about a techn uh, technical piece, mm. does that go with the contract for the caretaking of that work into the future? Like the the technology might change over time. Mm -hmm. How do we look after that? How does a collector um, yeah. take care of it into the future? Well, that is a conversation <laughs> that is co absolutely ongoing right at the moment. The, the particular works I make, I try to make it very simple, switch, plug it in, switch it on, turn it off, for those reasons. I don't want somebody to be wondering if it's the programming is, like the, the little chip is built into the piece, it literally you will switch it on and switch it off. So it's already in there, but there is some very complicated pieces that are running off hard drives that, yes, people don't really know whether those hard drives are going to work with their, you know, <laughs> with yes. their, their next version of... I mean, I have, I have work on hard drives on an old Mac that won't work on anything. And, and that work is only eight years old. So 30, 40, 50... It is really... It, this is, it is a whole other conversation, but it is a very important one. And, and also, especially as the value of art in many cases is tied up with legacy. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can't actually access the legacy work, then what is the value of the piece? So they are all questions that are... I think they have a concert techni technical conservatives and museums now, you know, totally dedicated to yeah. the after the work for the future. Going back to Dan Flavin and yeah. you know earlier Nanjing Pike and those monitors and how do you look after them into the future? Yeah, and that's all very costly conversation, and especially if nobody's actually thinking about that into the future. You know, if it's a catch up, so you know. Keep it simple. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the paintings will always be painted. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to 
just uh, I'm, I'm just a, oh, I'm not locked here, so I'm not too familiar with your work. But I think um, art has become very um, technical, very basically electronic. Mm -hmm. uh, PC, all that sort of stuff. And what's your feeling about that? Uh, I'm with more traditionalists, like paintings on the wall or paintings on, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder is, uh, is art moving away from what it's, what it's meant to be? It's becoming, um, it's becoming sort of a. Uh, both were corporate and in part of are are on the board, you know, but they business of companies who um well, there is that. Yeah. There is that. There's the big public uh, works that are, you know, one of the things that's happening now, I'm sure you're aware of, is that architects and design, interior designers are building in the artwork into the design of a building. So they may have a favourite artist whose work they like and they will pitch that work when they're pitching a design and uh, maybe there's a lobby or a set of corridors or, or boardroom offices and it will it will, there is there is that my own feeling is that's a great thing for artists because that's another uh it's another avenue to go down and that is to be able to present yourself um in different contexts especially for lo locations you know um I, I it's exciting to me that public art now is 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 a is really a thing that's important, but to your point about um, you know are artists stop going to stop making work and make technology? I don't think so because if you look at art schools right now or if you look at um, online technology, uh, like if you look at painters on Instagram or um, Facebook or LinkedIn, it's it's. I think there's more painters than I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what you think, Anna, but it's incredible the explosion of artists. Well, I do is I take photographs on the street, of street art, as you call it. Right. Basic stickers of poles, poles, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I do, it's, it's pure, just chance. I'm just, just what I'm putting on Facebook. And I, I, I regard that as someone's work of art, although it may not be attended as a work of art. That's, right. If you can figure out what I'm trying to say. But I think art is it's impulsive, it should be. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I think in this context, we're looking at we're looking at artists who um, have used light in their in their conceptual, you know, in the in concepting of the ideas, and then also in the delivery. So, what's sort of interesting to me, maybe about these shifts, is it's maybe it's less about. Uh, is it changing? Uh, it's more like how are we integrating it, you know? And is it is it adding? Is it bringing? Uh, for me, I like to feel that there's a way to um, amplify the experience that you might be having. So there's just one last point. I think graffiti is, gets a lot of bad press, but graffiti is to me from in our form. I think it well. I mean, if you look at the auction house prices for some of the graffiti artists. <laughs> Yeah. It's yes, it is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. But that goes back to cave paintings, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine, yeah. can I just ask one other question? It says that you went to Belfast and then to New York. Do you feel that young art students need to travel as much, maybe, as they, as you might have interest with the access and action? I don't know. I mean, I mean, we left Alexa, you know, all, the, all of the um, friends here who left and either left and came back or left and stayed. You know, we left in very bad times. Those times are not the times. There was no, there was no, there was nothing really. Coffee in on Ann Street, maybe? <laughs> you know, I mean, there was certainly no, um, I mean, Helena, you, you guys can speak to this more, but there was certainly no, um, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, Silicon, and anything, nothing. So um, our reason for leaving was, was where was it happening? It was not happening here, so where was it happening? And if you really wanted to grow and expand, you were going to go to where that was happening. You know, it was either Berlin or Amsterdam or New York at the time we were, we were going. And then it became Australia and other places took over that. But certainly for us at the time, you know, 
Um, and New York at that time was in the mid 80s. Uh, I'm not sure we really realized how incredible it was until we, in retrospect, it was so extraordinary because we were going to nightclubs and you'd be looking over there and there'd be Andy Warhol and Jean Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring and, you know, you'd be just like, oh yeah, there's Keith Haring, you know. <laughs> and, um, and you might have just come from their opening at Tony Schifrazi Gallery and then you'd all go to the next place and then you'd all end up somewhere else. So I think it was a particularly um, incredible time, but also uh, completely overshadowed by the AIDS epidemic. So you had this extraordinary rise of incredible work completely parale paralleled with the, the death of some of the most amazing artists at that time. So being right in the middle of that also you are all things that are going to inform the work you do and how you think. And uh, so, so yes, I, travel is definitely important, but I'm not sure that you would have to be leaving here for the same reasons. Anymore. So, is that? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you.